And then I just want to introduce Nahid. Uh, I had a great time listening to Nahid's fascinating story of coming from Iran to uh, Virginia Tech to Texas Tech, and now to this area, right? Am I, okay. So uh, yeah, I'm looking forward to your talk. Um, hi, everyone. Uh, so today I'm going to talk about malware detection and classification <laughs> using uh, optimized deep neural networks. Uh, a little bit about uh, me, I got my PhD in, uh, from Virginia Tech in EC. Uh, I'm not a data scientist. Uh, my area of research is embedded system security, um, specifically side channel attacks and fault attacks, so I love Spectra and MITAR. Um, and also uh, cryptography. In uh, Accenture, I've, been, I've had the chance to work with uh, our uh, reverse engineers on malware analysis and automating their platform. So a little bit about the motivation of uh, why we are doing this. Uh, as all of you know, um, this is a graph from AB test in 2018. Uh, in 2009, we only had 29 million malwares. This number has increased to 811 malwares in 2018. So it shows an exponential growth in the number of malwares and the amount of data that we are working with. Um, this is an, a snapshot from uh, the internal uh, uh, interface tool that we have within Accenture uh, as part of the iDefense. Uh, iDefense is, uh, is an incident response team uh, that is working with, uh, as part of the Accenture. And part of the services that we provide is that for our clients, we determine um, if they have a um, suspicious file within their organization, we analyze that file and we, find, we uh, provide root cause analysis and find out, okay, uh, what is the source, who is the target, what can we do about it? So um, in this snapshot, it has been shown that uh, we have over 300 million malwares and on a daily basis, uh, we get over 140,000 malwares per day. And uh, we have about uh, 10 to 15 reverse engineers. So analyzing this amount of uh, files is kind of impossible. Uh, so traditionally, or the current platform within Accenture uh, relies on um, a static analysis and a kind of blacklisting methods, rule-based uh, and signature-based methods. Uh, but the problem is that, as you see again by this graph in um, AB test, 30% uh, of the malwares are zero days, and we can't do anything about those 30% of the zero day malwares. And also, it, it has been shown that um, if there is a zero day malware, it might take um, three to 10 months to find it and uh, fix it and find a solution for it. So uh, that's why we are proposing um, machine learning as a solution to our reverse engineers. So of course it brings automation and scalability, uh, but it is also um, uh, less expensive uh, for us because we spend a lot of money on training these reverse in, uh, engineers and malware engineers, and if we could direct this talent towards something that is worthy of looking to rather than looking into 140,000 uh, uh, files per day, uh, it would be better for our clients and it will provide a quality of service. So but it's, what is the problem though? The first problem is that we need labeled data and we need data that we can trust. As you see, we can't trust anything these days. <laughs> and uh, we need a large data set. So these two problems um, are result for the tech labs because we have this partnership with iDefense. Uh, they are proud that uh, every malware that they have, they have vetted manually. So we are sure that it's malware uh, or goodware. So our job now is to uh, help them uh, with the automation, scalability, and of course, uh, bringing a little bit of machine learning capabilities into the picture. So um, what we propose uh, to our malware engineering team is a hierarchical framework. Uh, we don't want to dis the signature-based methods completely, uh, but we, we uh, believe that this will solve okay, 70% of the problem, if it solves that, that part of the problem, that's fine. We, um, by applying the machine learning model models on the rest of the data, 
this will automate uh, their job and will reduce the workload for them. So um, we uh, first apply the signature-based methods. If it's matched with a Yara rule, then great. We know what to do with it. If not, uh, we um, propose two layers of uh, machine learning or deep learning model. Uh, in the first layer, we uh, basically have to say, b using simple features, if the file is goodware or malware, basically detection part, but in the second part, we have to uh, take a step further and also classify it, but not the, classif the normal classification that you, sh that you see in the literature, right? like uh, classifying to Trojans, backdoors, and things like that. Uh, we need to classify our files into cybercrime and cyber espionage. Basically, our malware engineers need to provide service for our clients, so we have to help them analyze um, the malwares that are actually targeted towards an organization have um, uh, directions other than financial gains, and this is the classification problem that we are trying to solve. Uh, so after that, we can say if we have cyber crime or cyber espionage, and uh, eventually if, based on a confidence score, we couldn't do anything about it, then we can send it to the malware engineers for dynamic analysis. So, uh, Yep, so for feature selection, um, there are static features and dynamic features. Uh, as I said, in the first place, we want to first look at the static features and see if we can do anything with those features because um, uh, it has been again shown that uh, dynamic analysis takes uh, uh, about 10 times time compared to a static analysis. So. Uh, in a deep learning model that uh, we propose, in the first level, we have malware and uh, benign files. Um, we try to extract as less features as possible uh, for two reasons. First of all, we want the model to be really fast because, as I said, 140,000 malwares per day. And also, we want it to be robust against adversarial attacks. So based on our uh, research, um, Adversarial attacks are much more stronger uh, when they have a larger attack surface um, to, be, to manipulate. So by reducing the number of features, uh, we actually tie their hands in manipulating those features. So what um, the features that we have chosen are just entropy, size, uh, number of sections, and then DLL imports and function imports. And I, I have an explanation about this DLL import and function import that I'm going to talk about later. So uh, we have a feature reduction phase and eventually we apply the deep learning model, a uh, five layer CNN model, uh, and we can say if it's malware or if it's benign. Uh, about this um, DLL import and function imports, uh, we have access to a large database of malwares and um, Based on our profiling, it, uh, we could detect over 6,000 function imports and 6,000 DLL imports, different type of DLL imports. In the literature, um, the way that um, uh, it ha the, these features have been treated is that they are treated as a binary feature, each of them, and then we can say if the malware has that function or it doesn't have that function. But the thing is that since we had these reverse engineers working besides us, we thought, okay, we don't need 6,000 features. We just need the most important features within them. So we did a profiling and uh, we basically, based on our profiling, found out, okay, what are um, the function calls that distinguish between malware and goodware uh, based on the ranking of their use in the recent uh, malware and goodware files. So um, out of those 6,000 features, we only chose um, 32 uh, features. We again checked these 32 features with the reverse engineers because their input could have helped us. Um, for example, in goodwares, we can say, okay, call or sleep or f functions like this might be helpful, but those are everywhere. It, it can be in malware, it can be in goodware. So we also vetted these features with the malware engineers and uh, then applied it to the uh, deep learning model. So, um, and what we gained um, with this is amazing. Um, if we didn't uh, do this feature extraction, 
um, we try to uh, we tried the model with over a thousand uh, function and uh, DLL imports and uh, using the non-targeted, non-iterative non adversarial attack of FGSM, we could uh, attack the model with 45% 40 um, success rate. Uh, but when we reduce the number of our features to 32, uh, basically uh, the attack couldn't find any feature to manipulate. So this actually made our model much more robust against such attacks. Okay, so you would think that this would make our reverse engineers happy, but nah, not so much. <laughs> they needed us to uh, do more job, help them more. So what we did is that we said, okay, um, for our clients, we need to um, find out if the malware is cybercrime or cyber espionage. So what is the difference between these two? Cyber espionage is actually um, uh, trying to uh, exploit information, steal information from uh, industrial organizations, military, and basically endangers um, nation state. But cyber crime is something that we might, all of us have seen, uh, 90, and it's just for financial gains uh, or like stealing resources, um, individual resources basically. And 90% of the time we are dealing with cyber crimes, only 10% of the time we're, we're dealing with cyber espionage, but it is really important to find out where that 10% is. And that actually helps our uh, reverse engineers to find out, okay, what files should we analyze. So in order to do that, uh, we uh, extracted some features uh, because uh, basically, Malware is malware, right? And if we want to find out if it's cyber smear or cyber crime, it's only we have to see what's going on in the mind of the malware writer. So um, cyber espionage tries to um, keep it low, low profile, um, doesn't show the um, uh, difference with the goodware. So what we have noticed is that um, these are interesting features that we have extracted. Uh, CE malwares, most of the time, uh, they don't have PDB strings in them. There is no hard-coded IP address or URL in cyber espionage. Uh, cyber espionage uh, usually has a smaller file size. The compilation time of cyber espionage is very similar to goodware, and goodware is written by good people who work from Monday to Friday. Cyber crimers look at malware writing as a second job, so they do it on the weekends or at late at night. So compilation time also is a feature that we have extracted. Uh, the type of cryptographic algorithm that they are using, most of the time cyber espionage uh, is using more sophisticated type of cryptography like elliptic curve cryptography. Uh, in cyber crime, just a yes, whatever is cheap, whatever we can get our hands on. So using these features, we created this classification model and um, for the detection problem, we had 20K malwares, 15K goodwares in our data set. And for the classification, we had the cybercrime and cyber spinach 8K and 6K, and these are the list of um, vetted cybercrime and cyber spinach files and uh, malwares that we have uh, in our database. Um, so here is uh, the results. Um, for us, as a company who provides such services, uh, false negative rate is the most important feature. Uh, so we try to uh, optimize our, our model considering false negative rate. So we have nine, over 99% accuracy in the detection and over 97% accuracy in the classification problem. Uh, with that, I want to thank my colleagues, uh, Malik Ben Salam and Ali Reza Salimi from my defense. And thank you guys, if you have any questions. Questions then? Yeah, where are you getting your labels for for, uh, for cyber espionage? Is it from APT notes or somewhere else? Yeah, our malware engineers helped us with labeling those. Uh, basically, there is an there is an overlap. Sometimes for cyber espionage, um, they might use cyber crimers and 
they might, but they will manipulate the files. So uh, based on the organizations that like send us those files and also malware engineers, have, we have labeled the data ourselves. Thanks. Mm -hmm. uh, I was curious, uh, did you have any success stories with this, uh, uh, the second model, the second classification model, where uh, you know you uh, turned up some cyber espionage samples that had never been seen before. Um, so we launched this model only last Tuesday, uh, but we have tested it with uh, new data, and it is correctly uh, classifying uh, the incoming data that we have. Uh, actually, recently we had a client. Um, uh, a banking uh, financial client, and uh, they keep sending us this uh, file, and they claim that, oh, <laughs> it's a malware, and they think it's cyber espionage, uh, but our model could detect that it's just a good where it's just because they don't update their systems. Uh, but yeah, they just do it once a decade. <laughs> Were there any sort of limitations around what stage of malware you focused on? For example, backdoors versus you know post-exploitation tools like Mimikatz? Um, no, actually we labeled our data considering like all types of uh, okay. these. Cool. Uh, so, um, uh, yeah, they're asking if there is any difference, uh, different um, or variations of data in terms of geography, like locations or timing. We actually consider uh, time zones, and uh, so basically using our uh, internal uh, tool, uh, what we also gather is that if there are any specific language or has been used in the malware, and using that language, we change the compile time to that time zone, so we consider if the, <laughs> and it actually uh, matches with our assumptions that, okay, cyber espionagers um, mostly work during, yeah, the week. Yeah. Uh, hi, very nice talk. I, I was curious about the architecture of your convolution layers, because, mm -hmm. you know, usually in, in image processing, we do convolution because the feature set is very large, like thousands of pixels. But you also showed us how you were able to reduce your feature set. So I'm curious why you need like five convolution layers and, uh, you know, how many nodes are there in each one of them? Um, uh, yeah, we, so um, the reason that we started this project <laughs> was not cybercrime and cyber espionage. The reason was that we wanted to implement uh, uh, such a CNN on FPGA. So <laughs> you wouldn't know where you were taking with your research. Um, so that's the reason we chose CNN in the first place. Um, but um, it gave us uh, good results. And in the beginning, we just put the whole exe into the CNN. Uh, over time, the number of layers has decreased. And uh, currently, um, the number the, uh, we only have less than uh, 50 neurons per layer. It's very small, and uh, we can train the model with the, mm, uh, our uh, train data, which is around 20K files, in less than four minutes. Yep. You say about 140 files per day you need to analyze? Mm -hmm. uh, 40,000, 140,000 files you yes. need to analyze? So after the first stage where you use antivirus to get rid of those this well-known ones, H how many are left that you still need to really? We have um, a, a rate of, like, uh, we can say it is detected, it is uh, malware, or we can say no detection. Uh, we can do it for around, like, more than 90% of the files, but around 10% uh, of the files is just unknown. We don't know anything about them. Okay, if there's no more questions, let's thank. thank